Welcome to another 21 Hats Dashboard brought to you by our sponsor, The Great Game of Business. I'm Lauren Feldman, and I'm here with Gene Marks. Welcome, Gene. Hello, Lauren. How are you? I'm doing great. Great to have you here. Appreciate it. Gene, you uh, wrote recently uh, about what you call a looming AI backlash against Microsoft and Google. You actually sounded kind of offended in the piece, which surprised me because you've been a big proponent of AI, um, not to mention a, a reseller of Microsoft tools. What's going on? Well, no, I am a big proponent of AI, and I've been speaking a lot about it and writing a lot about it on Forbes and um, excited about the future and all that kind of stuff. But I, I think that both Microsoft and, and Google are making a, um, a mistake. And, you know, as usual, I could be wrong. But um, what they're, what they're, they're both coming out by the end of this year or early 2024. Um, their, their AI tools for their, for their workspace apps. So in other words, uh, if you're an Office 365 user, uh, you're going to start seeing Microsoft Copilot. And if you're a Google, you know, workspace user, you're going to get a Google Duet. And, you know, both of these companies are competing against each other. So the features they're offering are very similar and they're fun. They're exciting and they're, they're going to help in productivity. Uh, they're going to help you write, you know, your Word documents, do quotes. Um, they're going to help you write emails, uh, attend more than one meeting at the same time, if you can believe it, analyze and get answers from complex spreadsheets. You've told us about it. You've gotten us excited about this yeah. in the past. It's all good. But here's the thing. Um, they're going to charge for it. You know, they're going to charge. Each of them are going to charge $30 a month a user to use these AI tools. On top of what you're already paying Yes. And I, I don't, I'm not going to pay that. And I don't know well, why I get it for free, actually, because I'm like Microsoft partner. Just don't tell anyone. But uh, <laughs> my, my, my clients, I don't know, many of my clients are going to be paying that either. It's, it just seems like a dumb move. I mean, for starters, I, and, I, and I wrote about this. First of all, we all know that anything that comes out of Microsoft, I mean, thank God this company doesn't build airplanes, you know? I mean, you know, they're, <laughs> they need like three versions of anything before they finally get it right. You know, it's going to suck when it first comes out. It's going to it's gonna be fun and exciting, but, you know, it's going to need a lot of tweaking, you know? Um, so that's number one. Number two is, is that like people aren't, they, they don't really know what they don't know. So the only way to really get them using these AI tools is for them to like, is to put it in front of them, you know what I mean? And, and let them start playing with it and then start realizing like, oh, wow, this is really cool. And that's what you do with it. You know, like most of my audience that I talk to, which are business owners, I ask them about AI and chat GPT, Lauren, and they don't know what, you know, they, they, they really aren't as familiar with it as you think. So there's that, you know, and then like, we're already paying for office or workspace a lot. That's one of the points you made in your piece, which is yeah. that they kind of convinced us to do this software as a service thing where we're paying a monthly fee and they constantly upgrade yeah. what they offer, but they don't charge you more every time they do yeah. an upgrade. To me, it's like a feature of Office, for example, this Copilot, not a separate app. And you know, the fact that they're they're now asking for more money is like, hey man, you got us into the cloud. We're now prisoner to your, you know you know, to your monthly fees that you charge us, you know, we got no choice now. Um, but okay, keep bringing on the features to, to, to bring value into my life. And, uh, and here they are saying, well, if you want this great feature, you're gonna have to pay extra for it. And I just think it's a mistake. I, I think there's going to be a backlash. And I think that a lot of businesses, particularly small businesses, I don't think they're going to buy into it. I really don't until uh, it gets out there further. And I bet you, that they're going to start revisiting their 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 payment plans for this and start you know offering that doesn't happen very often. Do you really think they might do that? I really do. I re I think you know when you look at any cloud based software, they always have different like tiers of software that they offer. You know the free version that does a de minimis amount of things, and then the standard, and then the professional version. Like every software company does that, including Microsoft. When you look at versions of Office and. I really think that if they, if, if they don't start offering some of this stuff for free um, with like higher tiers that you pay for once you start getting into it, um, I just I, I think people are not going to adopt into it very quickly. And uh, I think they're going to they're going to have a problem. Do you think this is specific to Google and Microsoft or is it an AI thing uh, that the backlash could affect AI in general? That's a really good question, actually. You know what? I, I, I like to write about that. You know, like I've been focusing on Microsoft and Google. Meanwhile, bunch of other companies are coming out with their AI offerings and, um, you know, like you, accounting softwares and CRM softwares and all of that. And 
I'll give an example. Like again, okay, we sell Microsoft products. We also sell Zoho. Zoho has a bunch of AI stuff that they're that they're have been offering already and are introducing more, but they're not charging extra for it. I mean, it's just part of the, you know, the platform. You know what I mean? And it, it's again, it's designed to keep you using their product. So um, you know, I, I don't I don't know if other companies are are gonna be doing this. And um sometimes I think it's like it's just um seems like a very short term approach. Yeah. Short term thinking. Yeah, it really is. It really is. So my prediction is, is first of all, I'm, I'm telling our clients, don't buy it yet. I mean, first of all, it ain't going to work very well. So you're going to be disappointed. Uh, you know, you don't buy this until it gets, you know, out there and really tested and you hear the feedback. Um, and then, you know, let's wait and see what Microsoft and Google do, because I, I just can't imagine they're going to keep charging for this. But You've told us about using ChatGPT and ChatGPT3, correct me if I'm wrong, is free, free. but, but yep. four, you have to pay for. Are you paying for four? No. And I'll tell you the reason why I'm not paying for four. I'm not a software developer. You see, the reason why you pay for four is because you license their, it's an enterprise version. So you can license their, their ChatGPT, uh, you know, their, their APIs and other software tools so you can build uh, systems for your business, you know, including, you know, obviously software and large language models. Um, the average consumer or the average small business person isn't doing that. So they're just using the free version of it. And that makes sense. Interesting. All right. Next topic. You also wrote recently about automating the paying and sending of invoices. Um, is, is this aimed at someone who's already handling invoices digitally or someone who's really still writing checks? This is all about getting rid of your accounting staff. That's what it is. <laughs> oh. And the, the vendors that sell this stuff, they're not going to say that, obviously, because it ain't politically correct. But you know what, Lauren? You and I are friends, and I can say politically correct things. And this stuff is all about firing people. And, and good for them, because accounting staff are overhead. I'm an accountant. And a lot of what accounting staff does can be automated and will be automated. And accounts payable is the perfect example. So... This was a piece I wrote for the Philly Inquirer last week. It is a, um, it, it, it's all about accounts payable automation. And there are some great country, uh, uh, great products out there, Avid Exchange, Bill.com, Ramp. Those are three that I, I used as an example, um, where once you get it set up, you know, your suppliers, your vendors, your contractors, I'm doing this, by the way, this year, um, they just email or text their invoices to you. Um, and then it, they, they go right into your accounting system after being set up by the it payables management platform for approval and then payment. So it, you know, you, it, it cuts down on time. You don't have the same kind of data entry mistakes. Uh, it, it helps you manage your cash flow better. It gives you good reporting. Um, and most importantly, it just it, it cuts back on the amount of time it takes for people to do this kind of stuff, which means... You cut back on people, and that's what this automation is is doing. It's using AI as well um, to intelligently read this data and code it, um, know when to ask for approval and when not to. Uh, it is it's really good stuff, and I've been seeing a bunch of my clients migrate to it, and we're going to do the same thing. Any concerns about losing control? Not eyeballing everything that's going out? No, because it's not. It doesn't have to be everything. I mean, you set your controls on your payables, so you know, eighty percent of our payables are pretty routine, so they don't really need that much review. You know, they're common expenses every month. But then there are certain payables if it's over a certain dollar amount, if it's from a certain vendor, you can flag them so that they don't get paid until uh, I get an alert about it, and then I I look at it and approve it. You know. So if somebody doubles the their fee and just sends it into your system, it's not it doesn't have to automatically pay it. Yeah, it'll get flagged. And and the best thing about it is that it gets flagged. Uh, whoever you want gets notified, like say me and say I'm traveling and I will get that notified on my phone. I can look at the invoice on my phone and say, okay, yeah, that's fine. And say, approve it. And then it goes. Whereas accounts, think just think an accounts payable person runs into this problem and then they got to email you and then they got to come back and maybe they have a question or maybe they didn't notice it at all. Who knows? You know what I mean? Um, so it's it's just better. It's just better. How complicated is it to set up one of these systems? It's a pain in the neck. So uh, <laughs> you'll, you know, to, I mean, this is not, and of course the vendors won't tell you that easy, you know, either, but uh, you know, I mean, you got, it's gotta be integrated with your accounting system. You know, your vendors have gotta get on board with it. 
your accounting staff has got to get on board with it. And these people are not stupid. They see the writing on the wall. So there's there's definitely issues, you know, that, you know, to get over it. I've been pushing my one. But is, is this is not being offered by the people like, you know, QuickBooks or whoever that you're already using no. where it seems like it should be. You think it should be. You're right. You really think it should be. And it's funny. It's it's offered by these by by various vendors like the three that I mentioned, which then integrates uh, with QuickBooks. But weirdly enough, uh, but Intuit has not gotten into that game yet. And in fact, Sage and Zero and some of the other larger uh, accounting software vendors aren't you know, doing this yet. Um, will they buy one of these you know, automation companies? You'd uh, think. Yeah, you would think. Um, but frankly, Bill.com has been around for a long time and I think they're publicly held as well. So you know they're they're you know they're, they're not new to this game and uh, no one's bought them yet so you know we'll have to wait to see is there a wide range of prices that these services charge there is yeah they're mostly built based on the number of transactions that you have um, they provide the services to help you get set up and obviously all the support but it, you know it, it's based on you know so yeah i'm a little dipsy doodle company so we're paying like the lowest price i forget what it costs per month but it ain't that much um, but larger companies that are processing hundreds of invoices will certainly pay more. All right. Let's talk about insurance. Everybody likes to talk about insurance. Oh, it's such an exciting topic. Uh, do you know we pay so much? When I look at our monthly budget, just personally, how much we pay in like life insurance and health insurance, it's nuts. I'm not, this isn't even a business thing. I'm talking about personally, you know, insurance sucks, but you got to have it. Right? Nobody wants to think about it. Nobody wants to deal with it. Until something happens. Right. So- Last week, I highlighted a story in the morning report about a survey that said a <laughs> it was a survey done by a business that sells insurance to small businesses, and this survey found that small businesses aren't buying enough insurance. Can you believe that? Yeah, I do believe it. I do believe Is it. Is it true? By the, way, you know, by the way, I'm not I'm not getting your morning report. Can you check on that for some reason? <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, yeah. This isn't where I expected on. to have that conversation, but yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not getting that in my inbox anymore. And it's definitely not in my spam folder because I do. I'm distressed to hear that. I will look into it as soon as we're done here. Well, make a note. I should, because I read that. I like that morning report. Anyway, uh, back to insurance. Yeah, does it surprise me that small businesses are cutting corners and um, not buying things that don't give them immediate gratification? You know, what a shock. Uh, you know, and then, you know, different small businesses, depending on where they're located, you know, sometimes are having a hard time getting insurance, you know, property insurance in California. All right, we'll get to that in a second. But, yeah. but just the basics, um, this survey found that most businesses are underinsured and in, in, you know, particular areas. Um, do you find that with your clients? I mean, is this something that you look, uh, dis look at and discuss with them? Yeah, people people do not have um, enough insurance. Um, there's there's these business packages um, that you can buy, um, which cover like the bare minimum, and then you should be buying like an umbrella or general liability on top of that. Um, we do. I have uh, you know I I have a service. What, what am I, what, what's the word for it? Um, in case we screw stuff up, um, uh, insurance malpractice insurance, right? So I mean you know th that's important to me. Um, we've never ever had to tap it. But it, it gives me a little bit of comfort. And I learned that, you know, the hard way. I mean, we almost had a big issue years ago and, you know, we got through it. But I was like, I am not going through that again without insurance. So I, I do strongly recommend that people pay and have that kind of coverage. Business interruption insurance is another thing. I was going to ask, do you have that? Yeah, they ignore that. Yeah, we do. We do. Um, the business interruption um, um, exposure that a lot of businesses have, it's not necessarily being hit by a hurricane. It's being hit by ransomware, you know, and, you know, you're down for weeks, potentially. Uh, that's really important. And then there's cyber insurance, uh, which a lot of insurance companies are writing and some of them are really making money off it. But it's it, it's another you know growing need that businesses need to have. I'm big on insurance and I think that people need to have it. And I don't see enough business owners buying insurance. So that does not surprise me. Do you stop and go back and review your holdings from time to time? Yeah, here's my beef. You know, like it, it's not only just with my business, but I, I use the same brokers for my business. And then I'm a treasurer of like a nonprofit. And it's like, Jesus, Lauren, it's like just getting there. They're not proactive with me at all. Insurance people, I, I'm sorry, man. There's something about that industry. They are just not proactive. You know, it's like, they sell your insurance policies to you. Um, and then it's like, you don't hear from them again until it's time for a renewal. And then you're basically just getting like an invoice, you know, from them. And I realize it's not every insurance person, but I'm telling you, man, 
you know, there are a lot of insurance people out there that I think really underserve small businesses. And it's the small businesses that need, need it the most, the most guidance. And unless you're proactive, it's like you don't get, you know, you don't get the results. So if you're a small business owner, you need to be beating up your insurance broker two months before. So it's not a, you know, it's, it's not a you know, fire drill. You should be, you know, going over your whole list. I have a spreadsheet that lists out my policies, the terms, the coverage, the premiums. And I'm literally doing this right now with an insurance broker. It's like four days for her to respond to my email. It's like my, my head's going to blow off my neck. <laughs> um, you know, and I finally got her attention and I said, next time I'm, I'm just, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to go to somebody else. Like you can't, you know, but anyway, so we, you know, we have a, an appointment scheduled in two weeks from now to go over our coverage so I can make sure two months in advance that we're in good shape. And if not, I need to know it now so I can make sure we, you know, we're budgeting for any insurance increases. But, um, I just think these insurance companies, um, I guess small businesses are such small potatoes. We tend to just be ignored by the insurance industry. And go ahead. If you're an insurance broker and you disagree with me, go ahead. Reach out to me. I mean, I challenge you. <laughs> and if you think you can do a better job, by all means, reach out to me. I will happily move my business over to you. How does that sound? I think you're going to hear from somebody. Good. Good. Reach out to me. I've got, I'm on the edge. <laughs> You brought up the uh, growing issue of uh, places where you can't even get insurance. Uh, last week, uh, I highlighted another story in the morning report. This is a terrific story from the Wall Street Journal about the owners of a home in West Palm Beach, Florida. They had been paying $15,000 a year for home insurance. So it was already you know, a little bit high. Uh, yeah. Then they got this year's renewal notice, which was for $121,000. <laughs> <laughs> now they wound up finding another company, but oh, the rate they're paying now only one hundred and ten thousand. Nope, thirty three thousand. So it was a lot less than that, but more than double what they had been paying. Um, and they were lucky to get insurance because a lot of their neighbors haven't been able to, and some of them have decided to to just you know go naked. And the I think the plan is if they're wiped out in a in a hurricane, which can happen in Florida, uh, they'll just sell the property, and and that's that. So a couple of comments on that. A couple of comments on that. First of all, if uh, if you are in Florida or California, I mean, if if the the insurance needs you have is for like natural disasters or whatever, one thing to keep in mind is that um, you know the, the Small Business Administration, when a, an area is called into a disaster area, they they offer very low cost uh, loans to get businesses back up on their feet, and they do that directly. Now you might be like, hey man, I don't want to go into debt. So that's not you know what I'm looking to do, but. In all honesty, if you amortize that out over the length of the loans, it, it might actually be, and you, you would have to do the math, a better deal than getting insurance at those rates. You know, you think to yourself, like, is there, there a problem? You know, what I would be paying monthly to pay back a small business an SBA loan, it, you know, might even be less than I'd be paying monthly for an insurance premium, you know? So you might just take the attitude of saying, you know what, we'll wait for something to happen. And when it happens, I'll go to the government and I'll get the low in, the low interest rate from them. And you know, and something might not happen for five years, you know, and then when it does happen, you amortize the cost over all the years that it didn't happen and you weren't paying premiums. So it's one approach that, you know, you might want to consider. Um, the second thing is, is that uh, states like California, New York, they're having these insurance, you know, these insurers pull out. I mean, ultimately, the states are going to have to step in and do something about that. I mean, that's just what's going to happen. I mean, most of them do have some kind of insurer of last resort um, right. in, in place, but they're getting overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's just going to have to be some issue. And again, the the insurance are, the insurers are pulling out from what I read uh, for a number of reasons. It's not 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 just like the risk of wildfires, but, you know, in California in particular, I know there's a lot of regulations and whatnot and blah, blah, blah. So it might not, you know, it, it might also be a case of the state taking a, a look at how they're treating that industry and giving them more incentives to come, you know, and write policies back in the state again. So but the state's going to have to step in. All right. Anything you're working on that we should look for this coming week? Yeah, a lot. So I'm going to write for the Inquirer next week how Philly businesses are preparing for Halloween. <laughs> what are you going as, Gene? I've got a <laughs> – I'm going as a, uh, a, a fan of a baseball team that's about – that will win the World Series. That's Ooh. what I'm going at. Um, the other one that I'm writing about, Lauren, which you'll get a kick at, um, one that uh, just came out yesterday, Sunday – uh, from the Guardian that we can talk about uh, next week, uh, where I talk about expense reports. You're going to have a good time with that article, uh, and we can have a good about how people 
play around with their expense reports and uh, my thoughts on that. And then the following week, during the week, interesting. Yeah, this week I want to write about um, United Airlines came out uh, with a new boarding approach. And uh, <laughs> so as a business traveler, because this ties into business. You travel a lot. I do. And I have, I have many thoughts on that as well. So we're gonna, I'm going to write about that for The Guardian and we can, that'll be something we'll talk about, you know, in the following week. That sounds great. Gene Marks is a CPA who writes weekly on small business for The Guardian, The Hill, The Philadelphia Inquirer, The Washington Times, The Chicago Daily Herald, Forbes, and Entrepreneur. You can also hear him on ABC Radio's Eye on the World with John Batchelor. Gene hosts two small business podcasts with Paychex Corporation and The Hartford. This episode was brought to you by The Great Game of Business, which helps businesses use an open book management system to help build healthier companies. You can learn more at greatgame.com. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Lauren. We'll see you next week. Have a great week, everyone.